so as Amanda said, it was funded by the Irish Research Council as part of my postdoc that I've been doing for the past year and a half here at UCT on the supervision of Louise. So um, the talk's not going to fully focus on cyberbullying. The first half will be about cyberbullying, but the second half will be more generally on about looking at online interactions that we have, um, good and bad ones, and how these make us feel. So it's not specific just to cyberbullying. But to start with, just going to look at uh, cyberbullying, the first half of the talk. So just look at the um, definitions of cyberbullying. So one of the first ones that emerged was in 2008 by Smith et al. And they defined cyberbullying as an aggressive, intentional act or behaviour that is carried out by a group or an individual using electric, electronic forms of contact repeatedly and over time against a victim who cannot easily defend him or herself. So that was one of the first definitions to emerge. And then... Another one a few years later in 2011 by Hinduja and Pachin. They had a, diff a slightly different uh, definition of cyberbullying, but they still kind of kept the rep repeti repetition factor of the definition. So they defined cyberbullying as when someone repeatedly makes fun of another person online or repeatedly picks on another person through email or text message or when someone posts something online about another person that they don't like. So there are two different, slightly different definitions, but about cyberbullying. So we also then had a look at um, an anti-bullying website as well to see what kind of information they were provided about cyberbullying. So we looked at stopbullying.gov, and they define bullying as bullying that cyberbullying as bullying that takes place using electronic technology. So they went a bit further then to explain what types of electronic technology they're talking about. So they said cyberbullying can occur through devices and equipment such as cell phones, computers tablets, as well as communication, including social media sites, text messages, chats, and websites. So it kind of gives them more information than the whole different ways in which cyberbullying can occur. And then they also then give some examples of what cyberbullying is. So it can involve mean text messages or emails, rumours sent by email or posts on social networking sites, and embarrassing pictures, videos, websites, or fake profiles. So you can kind of see from the information they provide on their website, it's kind of evolved from the earlier definitions, more rounded. Um, explanation of what cyberbullying is and how it can be um, the modes in which it can occur through. So um, we also then had a look then at some of the cyberbullying prevalence rates. So we looked at the differences between victimization and uh, perpetration. So this is a study that was carried out by Patton and Hinduja in 2014. So they, what they did, they reviewed all the literature to date that had looked at cyberbullying, victimization and perpetration. And then they kind of produced then the ranges um, of percentages for these. So they found that for cyberbullying victimization, it was reported in the literature that it ranged from 2.3% to 72%, whereas perpetration then um, ranged from 1.2% to 41.1%. So you can see here that victimization has been reported more than perpetration, but that it is slightly higher than victimization report rates. Um, so then what they, they concluded from this, that was about 21%, so that's one in four adolescents were the victims of cyberbullying, whereas 15% reported having cyberbullied others, so one in six, so they're slightly lower for those who are admitting to cyberbullying others. Um, so then in Ireland we just got some statistics from the ISPCC website, so they said from 14 to 16 year olds, um, I think this study was carried out by researchers in Trinity, that cyberbullying victimisation um, figures reported were up to 14%, whereas perpetration was about 9%. So, kind of found this interesting that there's different rates being reported across the board. So, this is um, interesting to know maybe if the definition of cyberbullying and how that's holding is this affecting the rates and the way that um, the levels that are being reported or not. Um, and we also, there's some more figures then provided then that traditional bullying is still more common than cyberbullying. Um, and the research also shows that traditional bullying and cyberbullying are closely related. So basically individuals who are bullied at school um, are bullied online and those who bully others at school are, are bullied online. And then there's some, some research looking at the impact that cyberbullying has on an individual. So the research has shown that it's related to low self-esteem, suicidal ideation, anger, and frustration, and there's also a number of other real world issues that it's related to, so it caused problems in school, antisocial behaviour, substance use, and delinquency. So, I suppose taking all of that together, the, maybe the right, varied or the range in the um, percentage of cyberbullying, victimisation, and, and perpetration being reported. And the fact that there's slight variations in the definitions. Um, before we went into any studies, we kind of actually wanted to get an, an idea ourselves of whether what um, adolescents' understanding of cyberbullying was. 
So we thought this would be important to form the further studies and also maybe um, the development of an intervention maybe to help buffer some of the negative effects that adolescents are experiencing online. So the first study then was a focus group exploring adolescents' understanding of online interactions and cyberbullying. Um, we had 49 participants, so there were 33 male, they were aged between 15 and 17 years old. Um, they were conducted in four different schools, so there was an average of 12 participants per focus group. Um, we conducted with transition year students if they were in non-exam year. Um, they were conducted in the presence of two researchers and all the sessions were audio recorded. So when we got all the data then, they were transcribed in two independent coders, looked, went through the data and generated themes based on what we found. So just to give an example of some of the questions we asked them. So we started off kind of more broadly. We had some general questions, just asked participants about their use of social networking sites. So what were the most popular sites for their age group? Um, how often did they use social networking sites? Um, we also then asked them about some good and bad things that happen when they're using social networking sites. So for example, maybe something good is for them is if they change their profile picture, um, they might get a lot of likes from their friends and a lot of nice comments about how they look. Um, a bad thing then is if maybe their Facebook or their WhatsApp mes message was seen and ignored, they um, identified that maybe it's been a bad thing that would happen to them when they're using social networking sites. Um, then we went on to some cyberbullying specific questions. So they were asked a number of questions about cyberbullying. Um, so they were asked to maybe give us, define what cyberbullying was, give us examples of what they thought cyberbullying was, how frequent is cyberbullying, and how does it make an individual feel. And then we also then just want to look at their understanding of coping skills. So they're just asked a number of questions about what they do when something bothers or upsets them, and if they found that an effective way to deal with these issues that they're having. So in total, we got um, seven teams. This is only squeeze four in the first slide. So um, top one there, the first is age and bullying. So. Um, in this, the transition year students, they were like the 16, average age of 16, they identified that cyberbullying appears to be more prevalent in the younger age groups. So they said, like, they identified first and second years who are about 12 and 13 year olds. So they said they aren't as internet savvy as older age groups. They also said first and second years do not discuss bullying. Um, they also said that the younger groups don't realise that they're being bullied and then that it only really starts being discussed in schools in third year. So like one of the quote texts take of this was that around age and bullying is you're insecure in first year and being bullied makes you feel more insecure. So it's, they see that as having a big impact on you when you're a younger age group. Um, they also identify privacy then as another theme related to cyberbullying. So some of the things that came up right here were sharing private information um, on about who can see the bullying. Quite often that they say it's done in private, so it's done through private messaging through Facebook or raise your friends or nobody else can see what's going on. Um, they also identified that it involves sharing embarrassing information, that is the reluctance to report the cyberbullying because it could actually make things worse, um, that you appear vulnerable if you're being bullied and also to not involve the teachers um, in cyberbullying issues as they can make it sometimes worse. So related to the privacy issue, they came up with this, that um, they said this, that friends wouldn't know that you're going through this, so this is kind of showing that it's happening in private and um, people aren't actually able to see like how often it's going on or how much of it is out there. So they also then identified that your online presence, um, defining your measure of work, so this kind of looks at the good and bad of using online sites. So they said that some of the good was like you can improve friendships, you keep up to date, um, your peer Perceptions of you and your peer reactions are quite important as well when you're using online social networking sites. Um, your friends will defend you then as well, so that's a good thing they would see. Um, then you also would have the positive feelings, so that from something good happening online, they identify that this you can feel good but it doesn't actually last long, it just kind of boosts your mood and then it kind of fades away. And then they identify then that the negative feelings actually last longer, so if something negative happens and you feel bad, it impacts you more than the positive. So, they said that the people can feel value then when using, using social networking sites. And then the next one that's quite an interesting one is the difficulty to finding cyberbullying. So that's another team that they identified. Um, some codes that then come up related to this where that was cyberbullying was embarrassment, can occur through blackmail, rumours, rude comments, indirect comments. Well, that's quite an interesting one we found because that you can actually um, maybe bully someone without actually stating their name. So if you someone had a fight, Louise had a fight with me and I'm wearing a kind of red dress, red, Louise could go online and say that I hate red dresses and people that wear red dresses and you don't know it was about me even though she didn't name my name because I'm wearing a red dress. 
So that's one way that people are being targeted online as well. Um, again, they said that they're uncertain of what cyberbullying is, and they also looked that bad is just a once off. So something bad happens online is only maybe once it happens, whereas cyberbullying is something that's more frequent. So what they said then about that was that it's constant involves constantly putting someone down. And then there's another three teams here. Um, and on image came up. So at first one of the coders had this in the same team as privacy, but then we kind of discussed it out and they agreed that anonymity was a team on its own. So related to this will be fake profiles, again indirect bullying, lack of proof. So basically it's an anonymous source, you actually don't know sometimes who the person is doing the cyberbullying, so it's hard to prove it. Again, anonymous sources there. Uh, cyberbullying rarely spotted again, it's almost like the privacy is done. Um, anonymously, you know, by maybe people you don't know, and then someone said you cannot trust anybody because you don't know who's cyberbullying you. Know, it could be your best friend, or it could be someone that you don't know. So, um, then just a quote related to this: as you say something, they can't recover the evidence of what you said. Then another theme then was personality that came up in relation to cyberbullying. So this seems to centre around that it depends on the type of person you are and how you interpret things, and that affects how if you see something as cyberbullying or not. So. And they also uh, picked out so gender differences, so the difference between males and females. Uh, males tend to seem to let things slide away just more easily than females, whereas they take it more to heart and kind of let, impacts them more. There's stereotypes of individuals they identify as being more easy targets to start bullying. So these involve introverted and quiet people, so they get bullied more than maybe someone that's more outgoing. Um, again, it comes out to depends on the type of person. And then that your mood can really influence how you perceive things. So that's um, the females were saying this that um, if they're in a bad mood, then they're going to take something more. You know, it'll have more of an impact on them than if they were in a better mood that day. Um, so then their quote from this is that it always comes down to what type of personality you have. And then the last one, that's another one that we're quite interested in, was dealing with cyberbullying and coping. So some of the techniques they came up with that they used to cope, or they would suggest to cope, would be to distract yourself, look for evidence. So get kind of get screenshots of what uh, the person is doing to you and be able to show that to someone. Tell a friend, avoid contact, mute, listen to music, or work out. So what they said was leave the phone, get away, and don't look at it. So I suppose the seven teams there kind of give us a good idea of what's going on with cyberbullying to be able to inform us for the next studies. So our summary then mainly would be that um, there's a number of different themes about cyberbullying and understanding of coping skills. There's still some difficulty around the definition of what cyberbullying is. And then there's a need maybe to explore some further coping techniques. For example, if you look at distraction, there's a lot of literature saying that that maybe is not as an effective technique as maybe conflict restructuring or conflict diffusion. So the two ones that we kind of focus in on the next studies are um, the looking around what exactly is cyberbullying. So we thought we'd look at it this implicitly, have a look at an implicit measure of how we could look at um, adolescents' attitudes towards cyberbullying. So um, I'll continue with this. So it just, I suppose implicit measures then are a popular method to examine participants' attitudes or belief to socially relevant concepts. So explicit measures then, such as questionnaires, um, they may involve intentional, deliberate and conscious <coughs> effort to respond, whereas with the implicit measures, they involve rapid responding under time pressure to automatic and automatic or impulsive of responding um, can said to be detective. Detective, sorry. Um, so one of the first implicit measures, uh, behavior measures uh, developed was the implicit association test. So this is the IAT. So this has been widely used to look at biases in areas such as homophobia, self-esteem and racism and also gender differences in sciences. So um, with the implicit measures, um, it uses uh, response times to actually look at the, this bias. So i just taken a relatively easy example. It says that um, it would be easier for participants uh, to uh, categorise flowers and pleasant together and insects and unpleasant together than it will be to categorise flowers and unpleasant together and insects and pleasant together. So categorising flowers and pleasant, for example, will be consider consistent with your views, whereas categorising flowers and unpleasant together will be considered inconsistent with your views. And then the difference here is seeing a difference in reaction time, response relation to these. To these. So you uh, participants would respond quicker to flowers and pleasant when they were categorised together than when they would when flowers and unpleasant were put together. So the IAT, just one study you could find, has been looked at, at the, um, been used to look at, and if you look at bullying. So in this study, um, the authors uh, wanted to look and see whether um, 
uh, using an IET could help predict bullying behaviour in uh, primary school children. So they formed the participants in this study. Um, they completed two IATs. So the first one um, involved an IAT on bullying. So they're asked to um, associate pleasant words with non-bullying images, so images of children having a good time together. And then they're also asked to associate um, unpleasant and bullying together, so unpleasant words along with images of children being bullied, so they could have like an image of a child being kicked. They also involved um, used a second IAT, so basically this involved was a priming IAT video that children were shown before they took part in the IAT and involved images from the previous one showing examples of children being bullied. And then the authors also used an explicit measure of um, the hope uh, to try and predict bullying behaviour. So they had self-reported, peer-reported and teacher-reported uh, ratings of bullying behaviour in this pop these students. So they found that the explicit, explicit bullying attitudes predicted bullying behaviour and that there was a significant interaction between implicit and explicit bullying attitudes. So that children with relatively positive explicit attitudes, implicit bullying attitudes were important predictors of bullying behaviour. So this kind of study shows that the IIT um, implicit test could be useful in looking at children's attitudes towards bullying. So um, we used a variation of the IAT when um, looking at their attitudes towards uh, implicit attitudes towards bullying. So it's a behavioural adaptation of the IAT. Um, it's non-association. It's the difference to the IAT and it's a behavioural measure of pre-experimental learned verbal relations rather than looking at associations between uh, stimuli. So um, it's similar to the IAT in that again it uses response latencies to look at these uh, potential biases in responding to consistent and inconsistent trial types. So the first study we conducted then using the IRAP was um, involved 43 participants, so there was 23 males who were aged between 15 and 17 with a mean age of 16.01 years. Um, before we conducted the IRAP they completed two explicit measures, so we call this the cyberbullying and bullying statements uh, explicit questionnaire. So basically what this questionnaire involved was participants being asked to rate statements that were used in the IRAP um, before they did it. So on a scale of one to strongly agree or strongly disagree with statements such as cyberbullying is malicious. So we wanted to get ratings of what they would be responding to in the IRAP before they completed it. And then we have two the IRAP tasks, so participants were asked to respond to a number of statements about cyberbullying and we also looked at this in comparison to bullying. So they were given two rules then to respond which alternated between blocks. So they had a room for consistent responding and a room for inconsistent responding. Okay, so it's a lot of information here. So basically the participants were given, for example, a consistent rule. So they were asked to respond based on the rules they were given and not their own um, opinions about cyberbullying. So in the first consistent rule, they're asked to respond to cyberbullying as if it's a repeated negative experience and bullying is a rare positive experience. So that's here the rule is that they're looking at cyberbullying as if it's something negative. So on screen here they were presented with cyberbullying is a word really that we thought showing cyberbullying to be negative so malicious. They're asked to select D for true or K for false if they agreed with the statement based on the rule they were given. So here the red arrow indicates the correct response. So when they're presented with a consistent rule that bullying is negative, cyberbullying is malicious, they're asked to select D for true to confirm this. Okay, and then they're also given an inconsistent rule. So then the blocks change. So another time another point after they've done respond to consistent ones, they're given inconsistent ones, and they're asked to respond to cyberbullying as if it is a rare positive experience. Um, bullying is a repeated negative experience, so the opposite. So when they're presented with cyberbullying is malicious, they're asked to say false because they're asked to say that cyberbullying respond as if cyberbullying was something that was good. So here it's shown here again that cyberbullying is positive. Again, this is another example or two of this consistent and inconsistent responding. Again, the consistent rule was please respond to cyberbullying as if it's a repeated negative experience, and bullying is a rare positive experience. So when they're asked to respond as cyberbullying is fun. When they were told that cyberbullying is bad, they would select false because cyberbullying would not be considered fun. The, uh, the inconsistent rule then again, they are asked to respond as if cyberbullying was a positive experience. So when they were said cyberbullying is fun, they would, with the consist inconsistent rule of responding as if it was positive, they would select D for true that yes, cyberbullying is fun. So, okay, so there's a lot here, sorry, but on the graph, but. Basically, we can see here the mean IRAP scores that were calculated with the reaction time so for, to the consistent and inconsistent trials. So 
uh, we've got scores from zero above zero and just below zero. So when participants were asked the positive scores here, so any score that's above zero indicates that participants were demonstrating an anti cyberbullying and an anti bullying attitude. Whereas any score below zero here is a negative score, they were participants were demonstrating pro cyberbullying and pro bullying attitudes. So what we found was when we looked at their averages to the cyberbullying statements that they were actually demonstrating um, negative scores for cyberbullying as viewing it as something negative and viewing it as positive. So in essence what that was meaning that they were responding as if cyberbullying was something good that was happening if their scores were below zero. So they weren't they were showing anti-bullying attitudes, they were showing more pro cyberbullying attitudes. But for the when they were asked to respond as if bullying is negative, they were confirming this, they're going, yes, bullying is something that's negative. And then um, when they were asked to respond as if bullying is something positive, they were actually responding as if bullying was positive as well. So there were significant differences here between um, participants' um, anti-bullying and anti cyberbullying attitudes, and also there was a significant correlation between their explicit um, cyberbullying and bullying attitudes. So what we were kind of in wondering then was okay is are they really viewing cyberbullying as something that is good like some talking to some of the students maybe when they're completing questionnaires they were saying that some of the things that were listed as cyberbullying being bad as cyberbullying but they would actually view as banter so they would say that like someone posting a funny video about you online could be considered something that's fun for them rather than actually an instance of cyberbullying and also then we were wondering maybe comparing cyberbullying to bullying which is a well-established everyone knows about bullying and what it is, um, maybe that was kind of causing these effects. So we decided then to run a second study then. So rather than comparing cyberbullying and looking at implicit attitudes to cyberbullying against bullying, we decided just to look at cyberbullying on its own, implicit attitudes to cyberbullying on its own. So um, we had 22 participants, so there were 16 females in this one, again, an age range of 15 to 17 years. Um, they again were given our up task. Um, they were asked to respond to a number of statements about cyberbullying and they were given two rules again in which to respond to um, the statements about cyberbullying. So here we go, like this one again, we're only looking at cyberbullying, we're not looking at bullying. So here the consistent rule is please respond to cyberbullying as if it is a repeated negative experience and not a very positive experience. So for viewing cyberbullying as something negative, cyberbullying is malicious, they would select true and go, yes, cyberbullying is something that's bad, so the consistent rule about cyberbullying being negative. Then for the inconsistent rule, uh, participants were asked to please respond to cyberbullying as a rare positive experience and not a repeated negative experience. So this rule was kind of going cyberbullying as something positive. So when participants uh, were presented with cyberbullying as not malicious, they would select true because they were asked to be in response to the cyberbullying if it was something good, so that's not malicious, and they would select true to confirm this here. Again, there's another example of consistent and inconsistent rules. So participants were asked to respond to cyberbullying with a repeated negative experience. So they may be presented with cyberbullying is and the stimulus fun. Um, here they could select correct um, to go for false. I mean correct, sorry, K for false here. So cyberbullying is false. They would say false is because they're being asked to respond to it as if it's just something negative. And then for the inconsistent rule, they're being asked to respond to cyberbullying again as if it's something that is rare and positive experience. So here, if they're presented with cyberbullying, it's not fun, they would select false because they're being asked to respond to cyberbullying as if it is something that is fun. So here now we've got slightly different results regarding cyberbullying from the first study. So here, when participants are being asked to respond to cyberbullying, uh, um, here we've got to look, explain these first, sorry, positive scores mean that participants are viewing cyberbullying as something that's negative and not positive. Whereas negative scores um, are showing that participants are viewing cyberbullying as something that is positive and not negative. So in the first instance, here we can see the scores above is a positive score. So for cyberbullying, when they're being asked to view as something negative, they are confirming this, they are responding as if it's negative. But then they're also responding again, the scores are below zero, so they're responding as well again as if it's something that's positive. So again, and here there is more variation again that they're viewing it as something that's negative and here it's relatively small but there's no bias really there. So there is kind of more confusion here that they are kind of saying that cyberbullying is something that's positive and also negative but it's not as clear cut. So it's, but it's more clear maybe than the conversion to bullying examples. So they are saying it is a mix kind of of positive and negative. 
So what the two um, kind of implicit studies kind of have shown us, so the first one, 2A, um, that participants demonstrated uh, strong anti-bullying attitudes and almost pro cyberbullying attitudes. Um, in 2A, there were no um, correlations between participants' explicit and implicit attitudes toward cyberbullying and bullying. Um, now in the second study just there, we only looked at cyberbullying. Um, participants displayed a mix of anti and pro cyberbullying attitudes. So I suppose what we're taking from this is that maybe it's the definitions of cyberbullying that they're slightly unclear and um, maybe some students' understanding of what cyberbullying is different to another's and again like maybe the factor about banter and it being something fun, posting funny videos or embarrassing photos online are having an impact here. So I suppose what we're taking from this is that um, maybe there is potentially a need for further training in schools or education around the area of cyberbullying and the topic of it. So for students to have a more clear understanding of what it is all. So that's kind of the first part of the talk on um, cyberbullying. So I just go into the word. Um, so this one, the next study now, we're kind of moving away from cyberbullying and just looking at online interactions that we have, like when we're using social networking sites. So this one is more of a pilot study that was, it was good, that was informing the development of an intervention study that would follow. So we kind of call this the likes and dislikes survey. So it's like, what are things that we like when we're using social networking sites, and what are things that we dislike when we're using social networking sites. And also from the focus group, it didn't come up as a team, but it was finding that um, students were finding it difficult to kind of identify or stage how much time they spent online and how much time they spent using social networking sites. So I thought the study might give us, if we try and capture maybe examples of what they're happening to them when they're using these sites and maybe uh, the frequency with which they're having good and bad experiences online, it might be useful for further studies. So um, we just looked up some statistics from Global Web Index. So they conduct um, research every year just looking at the different statistics around social networking sites. So they found that there are over 1 billion social network users within the 16 to 24 year old category. Um, and then they said that the average you, you know, social networker will spend like 1.77 hours online each day. So that's between using the various different sites, so Facebook, WhatsApp, I think Snapchat for younger age groups. I don't know if someone might else might use it, but I don't. Um, and so I suppose then we kind of they have some more statistics then about like why do people use the social ne social networking sites? So. The, um, the top five reasons now here from a survey um, said that people use it to stay in contact with family and friends, so 55% respondents said this. So that was the actual top reason. Um, to stay up to date with current news and trends, 41% respondents said it was for this reason. 39% uh, said it was to fill up spare time. 39% um, again said it was to find uh, funny and entertaining content, so um, articles and videos online. And then 38% that this was um, to share my opinion. So. Um, they also broke it down into the top social networking sites. So they said teens. So they said teens were um, individuals between 16 and 19 years of age. So the top site is YouTube. This came up as well in our focus group discussions that YouTube is one of the popular ones, and they like like girls like you like to learn about makeup and hair tutorials and this. Um, adults then 19 plus. So Facebook then is the most popular social networking site. This age group. Um, so what we're interested in as well is that. Um, are your top reasons for using social networking sites um, always positive? So for example, if you're staying up to date with your current news and trends, like this may be good that you learn new things, but also there are kind of maybe bad things that could be associated with this as well, or negatives that you might actually get into an argument if you comment on a news article with someone and it kind of could become something more than it actually started out to be. So this is um, this kind of comes up quite commonly with the students, the younger adolescents in relation to YouTube that they can get into fights kind of in the comments section of um, videos that they're watching. So in this study, um, so the pilot again, it was just look at the to look at the frequency with which like older adolescent populations. So we're looking at college students here in the first instance and the study is also being currently just we're finishing it up with um, adolescents, so 14 to 60 year olds. So we want to look at the frequency with which they have good and bad online experiences. So we're calling these online experiences that they like and online experiences that they dislike. So they would be the negative experiences. So we want to see what they are, or how frequently they're happening when they're using social networking sites. Um, we also just, a second aim was also just to look at maybe whether monitoring or reporting, reporting the frequency and types of interactions they have, um, will this have an amelioration effect on them? 
So in the study initially, 26 participants started out, okay, so 21 female, um, they're aged between 18 and 23 years of age. Um, we took a number of measures, uh, just screening measures to begin with, so also participants completed the DAS, the acceptance and action questionnaire, so it looks at their um, levels of willingness to have thoughts and um, before they begin, a uh, positive and negative effect scale, the thought scale, so this is a scale that where we ask, when participants are asked to identify thoughts they have about themselves, that they would be able to rate the extent to which they were comfortable having the thought, the extent to which they believe this thought about themselves and their willingness to have this thought. And we also had the daily likes and dislikes uh, survey. So what the daily likes and dislikes survey involved, it was like a survey that was given out over a period of five days, so every evening participants received a link to the survey and they completed the survey each day and they were asked a number of questions on it. So for example, they were asked, how many interactions had they in the last 24 hours that they liked or disliked online? Um, to give an example of this interaction, so again, it could be maybe that the friend tagged them in a funny video on, online and they found they liked that interaction. Um, and identify any thoughts they had about themselves after this online interaction. So if they had the disliked interaction that I'm calling, so for example, if their message was seen and ignored, they may have the thought that I'm unpopular or I'm sad. And then they're asked to rate these thoughts about the like thoughts following liked interactions and the thoughts following disliked interactions um, based on the scale, so the believability scale, the willingness, and the comfort scale. So just to recap, then kind of overview, experimental overview. At time one, they're asked to rate, complete the pre-experimental questionnaires. Time two, for a period of five days, they completed the likes and dislikes survey. And then time three, we just um, gave them again the same questionnaires that we did at the beginning, just to see if there was any changes, maybe as a result of completing the survey um, during the week. So this is just an example of the thought scale that participants were asked to complete. So it's like a slider scale. So um, scores closer to zero showed that they were extremely comfortable, willing and willing to have the thought and they found this thought extremely believable. So for example, if they thought I'm sad, a uh, score closer to zero would show that they were comfortable having it, um, but they also that they really believed this thought to be true. A score close to 100 showed that they were they didn't like the thoughts or they're extremely uncomfortable having it, unwilling to have it and they found it unbelievable. So they just kind of rated them along this like for each liked and disliked thought they were asked to rate um, this after each each day. So now originally 26 started we only had about we had a low enough completion rate um, to try to five days. So uh, we can see on day one the most participants completed the daily survey, so that was twelve. There was eight participants in days two and three and seven on days four and five. Um, so then we can get an idea now of how many, the number of participants who had actually um, uh, online interactions that they liked and disliked in the last 24 hours when they were completing the survey. So um, on day one for the liked, they had um, eight out of 12 participants reported that they had an online interaction that they liked in the past 24 hours. Day two, slightly lower, four out of eight. Day three, five out of eight. Day four, six out of seven. And day five was almost the lowest. It was only two out of seven who reported that. Um, disliked interactions, again, they're having disliked interactions in the last 24 hours. Report, they're reporting that they're having them, but the skin is slightly lower than the liked interactions. So day one was five out of 12 participants had a disliked interaction. Day two, only one out of eight. Day three, two out of eight. Four, three out of seven. And day five, again, was low with only one out of seven having an online interaction that disliked. Um, so we also looked at the mean number. They're asked to report the number of like, online interactions that they liked and disliked in the past 24 hours. So Again, we can see the mean number, so it's pretty, it's highest on the liked ones. On day one, it kind of evens off, it's pretty steady there. So between um, maybe 1.4 to 2.5 is the range there, the averages. And then the disliked, um, I suppose day two and day five, of the report is slightly higher um, averages of having thoughts, but this um, must be noted as well that there was only one participant on both of these days. So it doesn't necessarily mean they're having more disliked interactions, it's just the one person maybe was having more that particular day. Um, so just some examples of some of the things reported. So we asked them to give examples when they're having these online interactions that they liked and disliked. So I um, to give the thoughts they're having about themselves after they had these interactions. So um, some of the liked online interactions were receiving funny Snapchats. So the participant then said, I felt like I was funny. A lot of likes in the profile picture was another one that participant then thought I'm pretty. Um, posted a funny video on a friend's Facebook page for their birthday. This participant said, I felt like a good friend. Um, so they also then gave some examples of the disliked online interactions that they had. So this participant said, I looked at a boyfriend's Snapchat, 
thought they had about themselves then was I don't didn't feel attractive. Um, someone else said that seeing pictures of hot celebrities online that was something that they disliked because it made them think I'm ugly and fat. So, and then someone else said they didn't like that nobody liked my post. So maybe they posted something on Facebook or Instagram and they thought about they had about themselves after this was that I'm sad. So. Um, so I just kind of come back to the uh, thought skills with the believability, willingness and comfort of the thoughts. So participants are asked to rate um, their willingness, believability and comfort of having these thoughts as <coughs> for the liked and disliked interactions. So um, on each day of the five days of the survey. So the disliked interactions are red and the liked interactions thoughts are blue. So um, if you see uh, close, so we're looking at the comfort and having the thoughts here in this graph. Um, Zero means that they're extremely comfortable having the thought, whereas 100 means they're extremely uncomfortable in having the thoughts. So the score, the averages across the days for the liked thoughts was lower for the lower than it was for the disliked thoughts. So it showed that participants were more comfortable having the thought if it followed an online interaction that they liked, rather than if it followed an online interaction that they disliked. Um, again, we looked at the thoughts again. This is the believability of the thoughts. So. There's a bit of variation here. They're kind of similar across the days. Um, it was almost averaging around the middle 50s, so they weren't really believing or disbelieving the thoughts, except for on the last day. Um, for the disliked online interactions, they said it was extremely unbelievable. But again, this is only one participant completing it, so um, it might be different if we had more participants having that interaction. Um, they also rated um, how willing they were to have these thoughts across each of the five days. So again, the blue for the liked their willingness to have the thought was close, slightly lower than it was with the disliked interactions. So again, they're slightly more willing to have thoughts about themselves following online interactions that they like rather than ones that they dislike. Um, so we also just kind of made sure to have a check, look at the differences on the different um, pre and post experimental measures of the DAS, PANAS, AQ, and the thought scales from pre to post test. And there was no significant differences here. So the like. Um, what we kind of our summary then from this study, which was that um, the self monitoring and portioning of the online interactions did not affect mood and thought measures. Um, more participants want the proportion they had liked interactions in the last 24 hours and they had disliked interactions. Um, the mean number of online interactions each day was slightly higher for the disliked online interactions, but again, that could be due to the fact that there was less participants reporting that they had disliked interactions in the past 24 hours. Um, so, across five days, now we didn't run statistic analysis on this, it was low in completing the survey across the five days, but participants were less comfortable, less willing to have a thought if it followed an online interaction that they disliked. So just kind of from this, it kind of provides with useful information because it showed us that individuals are having online interactions, good online interactions across um, you know, every each day, like maybe not every day, but they are having those, but they're also having ones that they dislike. And it's shown from the thoughts that they're recording the experiences that these are slightly ha these are having an impact on them as they are reporting that they're having thoughts like negative thoughts about themselves as a result of these experiences. So it's kind of useful information just to determine the frequency with which these are happening, I suppose. So um, kind of led us on then maybe to the next study that we're going to look at. Then it's like the effectiveness maybe of a brief um, intervention in reducing the negative impact of these thoughts. So what we're kind of looking towards is building resilience in the adolescent population to um, these online interactions that they dislike. So this is um, now the next study again. It's like conducted with um, adolescent populations. So we're just looking at the effectiveness of like a brief um, intervention and how this may reduce that negative impact of the thoughts. So um, one of the techniques we used was uh, called cognitive diffusion. So this is taking a technique from acceptance and commitment therapy. Um, it is designed to uh, reduce the function of the thought by altering the context in which they occur. So what the aim is to see thoughts as what they are and not what they say they are. So rather if you have a thought I'm stupid, just to see it as a thought rather than actually going about and believe that you are actually stupid. So there's uh, different techniques that are used in cognitive diffusion to help um, achieve this and see thoughts as what they just are and not what they say they are. Um, so one of them will be to create distance from your thought by um, prefacing the thought with I am thought that dot 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 I am ugly. So this is one that I've just an example I've taken from what was reported by a participant in the previous study. So you would have 
uh, I am having a thought that and then you would state the thought you're having so that was one of the techniques. Another technique is uh, musical thoughts so you would have this thought you would sing it out in a funny voice or to a theme tune so for example you may sing the thought out in the tune of happy birthday or you could sing it in um, the theme tune of any one of your favourite songs. Um, you might also try saying this thought um, with a funny voice so if you pick your favourite cartoon character for example Donald Duck you might say the thought in that voice so these are just some of the techniques then that are used to try and achieve a cognitive diffusion from your negative step or inferential thought. So um, one study to employ diffusion was a study conducted by Larson Hooper, Osborne Bennett McHugh, so Andreas is a PhD student of Louise's who was here for a brief period of time. So he was looking at the effectiveness of cognitive diffusion and cognitive re restructuring um, in comparison to a control condition uh, to reduce the literal meaning of negative self-referential thoughts in student populations. So just to kind of quickly go through what CBT and cognitive restructuring is in comparison to diffusion. So with restructuring techniques, they are based on the premise that changing the way clients think will change their emotions and their behaviours. So they have a number of common techniques as well. So you would challenge the truthfulness of the thought. So you look at the evidence for and against the thought. Um, you would identify the thinking areas that the thought exemplifies. Um, then develop an alternative and more realistic uh, way of reflecting of expecting their experience. So back to the Larson test study, so he compared uh, the effectiveness of cognitive diffusion against co and cognitive restructuring against control condition. Um, so over a five day period, uh, both of these groups, the diffusion and the cognitive restructuring groups, they're given a series of exercises to help them manage their negative thoughts. So again, the diffusion, they were given the ones that we mentioned earlier of having the thought that, uh, musical thoughts and funny voices, given instructions, they're brought into the lab, given instructions about this and given a sheet to take away with them to remind them of the exercises. Um, in the restructuring group, um, they were given a list of common thinking errors and were asked to recognise these errors throughout the week and to try and generate an alternative way of thinking. So some of the examples, they were given a list again to take away with them. So some of the examples of the common thinking errors were fortune telling, so predicting the future instead of seeing what happens, catastrophizing, uh, jumping to the worst possible conclusion, black and white thinking, or overgeneralization. So, and then pre and post intervention participants in all three groups, including the control group, uh, again, they were using these rating scales, so they're asked to rate the believability of the thought, their negative self referential thought, the discomfort associated with the thought, and the, neg the negativity associated with the thought, and the willingness to experience the thought. So they found that the cognitive diffusion group um, significantly lowered the believability um, of the negative thought and increased the comfort and willingness to have the negative thought. Um, similar games are also noted for the cognitive restructuring group. Um, so they mix significant games in thought discomfort, negativity and willingness to have the thought. So the Larson study is showing that giving participants these brief um, interventions is helping uh, reduce the impact of the negative thoughts. So what we wanted to do then was to um, replicate and extend the study, so we kind of adapted the study. We in the results in the report now it's only just the cognitive diffusion group um, in comparison to the control group, and um, these interventions were de delivered online. So what we did in study four, we wanted to look at the effectiveness of a brief cognitive diffusion intervention delivered online and helping college students deal with negative self-referential thoughts. So this is kind of also looking at the thoughts that they had after they had online interactions that they disliked. So they're randomly assigned to one of two groups, um, the diffusion group or a control group. Um, it started out with 35 undergraduate students, there was 25 female, uh, age range of 18 to 23 years. Um, in the diffusion group there was 18 participants, in the control group there was 17. Um, they were given a number of measures, again they are given the DAS, the AQ2, thought skills and the likes and dislikes questionnaire. Um, then they were asked to identify a negative thought about themselves. So they were asked to generate a negative self-referential thought. For example, I'm unpopular after they have an online interaction that they dislike. So they may have thought I'm unpopular if they didn't receive as many likes on their new full Facebook profile picture in comparison to their friend. Um, then they were asked to rate this thought on like a scale again in terms of believability, comfort and willingness to have this thought. Um, so all participants in the diffusion and control group did that, um, whereas participants then in the diffusion group were given um, three strategies to help them deal with this thought throughout the week. They, the examples that I gave earlier, they were given this one as to use I'm having a thought that, musical thoughts, and then the funny voices. So there are the three strategies they were given. The control group weren't given these exercises, but instead were given instructions about how to complete the survey each day. 
Um, so participants in both groups, similar to the previous study, they are completed a survey every evening for five days. So they were asked about their negative self-referential thought um, that they had in the past 24 hours. And they were asked to rate this thought again in terms of the thought skills. So um, just an experimental overview showing what exactly participants were exposed to. Their time one, they completed the pre-experimental questionnaires. For time two, for the diffusion group, they're asked to generate a negative thought and they're given instructions on the diffusion exercises. Time two, for the control group, they're asked to generate a negative thought but they weren't given any instructions about any exercises to complete. Time three then was the five daily diffusion <coughs> text message reminders and online survey for the diffusion group. So they were kind of given a reminder like, remember that a thought is just a thought and then please go to Dot, 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 www to complete your online survey for today. Um, time three for the control group, they're given five daily text message reminders just to go on and complete the survey for today. And then at time four, we took um, the measures again, post experimental measures of ratings to the DAS, NAS, AQ2, and the thought skills. So the results here it just shows the differences in the ratings to the DAS, all the sub skills between time one and time four. I'll go into more detail on these again. I get to the statistical analysis. Um, it also shows a number of participants then who are completing the survey across the five days. So starting out the diffusion at 18 and 17, so there was high completion rate nearly across most days for the diffusion group. Um, again, control group out of 17, there was a high enough completion rate as well for each day of the survey. Um, so again, as well, the number of participants are actually reporting that they're having this negative thought that they identified in the past 24 hours across the five-day survey. So on day one, the shooting group, uh, there was five out of 18 have reported having had this thought. Day two, seven out of 17. Day three, nine out of 15. Day four was almost the highest, 11 out of 17 having reported having had the negative thought in the past 24 hours. And day five, about half the participants reported having this thought. Uh, the control group, quite a low number of participants reported having this thought in the first day, three out of 14. Day two was six out of 16. Day three is almost half, six out of 13. Day four again was the highest, nine out of 13. And day five, seven out of 14, reports they had this thought. Um, and then again, we're just looking at the different domain frequencies with which they're actually having this thought in the last 24 hours, the negative thought that they identified. So it's pretty similar between the groups. Um, day one, the diffusion group had a mean of 3.8 times the thought had this thought, and then the control group had a mean of 3.67. Um, again, across the five day survey, we asked them to rate the thought in terms of the, their comfort in having the thought. So here you can see the red now at this time indicates the control group, their ratings to having the thought, the diffusion group is the blue. So this graph, in terms of comfort, the diffusion group. Scores were close to zero, so it means they were more comfortable having the thought. It reported that they were, apart from day two, more comfortable in having the thought than the control group. Um, in terms of believability, both groups were pretty similar. Um, the almost just ranging from just above 30 to 50, so they weren't extremely saying that they were, it, the thought was extremely believable. Both groups were similar here. And then in terms of the willingness to have the thought, um, again, the control group is the red and close scores closer to 100 show that they're extremely unwilling to have the thought. So the diffusion group were more along the middle, so they were, for the first three days, they were neither willing or unwilling to have the thought, and then they kind of spiked up a bit and showed that they were a bit unwilling to have it, but then returned down again, whereas the control group were slightly higher across most of the days, apart from day four, showing that they were less willing to have the thought across those days. We also ran some statistical analysis and we found Looking at pre post tests, we found a significant effect for time. So I actually found that the DAS depression scores increased for the control group following the five-day survey. Um, we found a significant effect for group. So at post test, the stress levels were significantly lower for the diffusion group in comparison to the control group. And that we didn't find any other differences on the DAS anxiety or AQ or the thought skills as well. So um, what we kind of conclude from this study is that the control group then were less comfortable and less willing to have their negative self-referential thought than the um, diffusion group. Uh, there was a significant difference between diffusion and control groups on their DAS stress levels at post-test. So um, the diffusion group has significantly lower levels of stress post-test. There was a significant increase in the DAS depression scores from pre to post-test with control groups. So the depression scores actually increased on the DAS. And um, so what we're saying is that like this brief intervention has the potential maybe to reduce 
the negative impact of thoughts that you have following online interactions that you dislike. So we have some data as well that we'll be combining with this, looking at um, the effectiveness of cognitive restructuring techniques in comparison to diffusion as well, seeing the impact that this has. Maybe it'll be interesting to see what happened when we compared the three groups. And then just one final study, I'm not going to go into much detail, just that it's ongoing. We're actually running, this is being conducted at the finished off now at the moment, basically with um, teenage or so we're looking again at adolescent population, 14 to 16 year olds. They're we're looking at the impact of cognitive fusion and restructuring, cognitive restructuring and reducing the impact of negative thoughts following online interactions in this group. Um, what participants are doing at time one again, they're completing a number of pre-experimental questionnaires. Time two, they're completing the likes and dislikes survey from those outlined in study three. And time three, um, they are having an in-class workshop on the different techniques. So one group is given the diffusion, um, a workshop on diffusion, they're explaining what it is, given a list of techniques to use. Uh, another group are having the restructuring group, again, explain what it is and techniques to use. Control group then are just having an informal discussion about cyberbullying and online experiences and what they think. And time for then just collecting data on this, looking at post-experimental, um, again, the cha any potential changes as a result of the intervention, so the same skills again are being used. And I just say thanks to the schools and students who took part to the weeks for all their help the past years and the members of the lab here in UCG and particular Martin, Lynn and Orla who helped with a nice collection. And yeah, a nice and that's what's happening at my dad. It's all fun. 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 You know, we just let them give it, we give them an example maybe of what cyber interactions are and we kind of went with that and gave them a definition of that and what kind of modes and what they use and what we're talking about, like, you know, so Facebook, but it could be text messages as well and stuff, mm -hmm. yeah. I, mean, I was interested that you're asking young people to write thoughts in different ways because I felt like it was a really big learning point when I thought mm -hmm. that I would write a thought for believability or that I had some control over those things, yeah. but those are quite advanced kind of things to ask a young person to do. Have you any thoughts or comments on how they engage with that kind of process? Well, we don't really know from the, um, the older adolescents now. I suppose they did kind of, at first, I think they were, but what is this, you know, being asked to do it, but we didn't really have any... I've seen the, the two measures before and after they did it, which showed no difference, but I was just interested in just even asking a young person. Yeah, oh, I know, because the language, yeah, yeah. we kind of made it go like we trying to say it's this is extremely believable, it's like it's okay to have this thought, or then it's not okay. So we kind of change the language around a little bit more kind of use of like, age friendly. Yeah. Yeah. You just think if we, we got to find out, could, could they answer the, the, the question of believability and comfort and willingness? Yeah. We, like, we, we, we used what we wanted to use, the, the, the measure that we say Masood has used before with thoughts that we could apply it for the, the, the diaries across the days. Um, the, you know, the outcomes were the last day, but we were trying to think of ways in which we could see is there any ways where we're actually impacting this? Because the ways we're structuring and diffusion should be working would be slightly different along willingness, believability. Um, yeah. But look, not that, you know, we weren't getting the differences there, but we were in, in stress at the end. So it could be that it's, it's hard to understand what was been asked in those many pieces. Um, yeah. I think that, like, the, the, the study three was that pilot where we went from mm -hmm. the focus groups and they basically couldn't tell us how often they had a negative experience. And we were like, we want to design an intervention, but we better be testing long enough that they will actually have a negative experience. So that, that, that study three was about finding out, like, yeah. I guess. How often can we reliably say that in five days they will actually have one? And we saw that like all of them were, were having at least three that were willing to report it in the twelve. So okay, we can do this five day survey with these these measures. But I think as you say, yeah, like the the, the outcomes with the stress it seemed to have the impact. But in between asking about willingness and comfort, I mean a little bit of psychoeducation around that at the beginning about what we actually mean by that more extensively. Yeah. The question, sorry, the question themselves could even contribute to that to be yeah. asked that question. Yeah, absolutely. I'm just looking at the data as well, and I don't know if I was right, but did you know, when I was looking back at the graphs, did you test whether the, the groups, you know, the control and the, the intervention were different at the start, because they looked like 
they may be different. So you know, yeah. the time that you've got, if if, it's, if they start off, I think one was seventeen eighty of one. Yeah, yeah. So they're quite a gap. Oh, there is, yeah, there is. So yeah. you know. Yeah, see that there's two of them there, and I suppose there's yeah, no, there is yeah. It was so. We do this. You would you would expect then potentially Probably not to likely to see your effects if 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 they if they were different at the beginning before the intervention. But began. I suppose yeah, the, it's the depression one, isn't it? The fusion yeah. and control pre or slightly dark. But yeah, the, the next. If you look at the yeah, next yeah. slide, it tells the next one. See, no, on again. Uh, no, your little graphs. See here. Your comfort, yeah. so you've got a 50 and a 75. And that's not, so you know, you yeah, it's already a yeah, yeah. And then there's two on from that next one after. See this one here? Yeah, yeah. Again, you've got maybe 80 and 50 before you begin. Um, well, I, suppose, I think they would have got the intervention here at this point, so they'd be told. Yeah, because yeah. I mean, different at the beginning is very much the yeah, yeah. at the end. Yeah, what's yeah. going on? It's pre existing differences of what I bought. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Because we yeah. need to, you know, because this is, this is, uh, you know, hot off the press yesterday, right? Yeah. So, but the other, the third group isn't in there, but there's a lot of things that we want to remove, like people who are high on certain things, starting yeah. out mm -hmm. and things that, you know, yeah. to, because, of, you know, to, well, even looking at that starting out, you know. Did you know your study too, you had very high nutrition, that was probably, you know, yeah. 20 oh, yeah. and then Did those two groups and those who remained in and then those who dropped out, did they differ on the main bullying measures? Sorry, study two. That was just where they started. With the three, one three. group that three. I think you mean three. Where it was twenty-six. Oh, we down to twelve. Is it when when we went in and we were measuring across time? Um, not, not the implicit measure, say, but the next one after that. The one, the likes and dislikes one. Yeah. That had only just one group, I suppose. So we're just looking at their differences in thoughts after liked and online and disliked interactions. So okay. they yeah. didn't have two. Groups. The same group where they just talked yeah. about oh, likes yeah. and dislikes. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Because it's kind of yeah, well, this is different. Same, this is two, two groups. groups. Sorry. Are, this is an intervention. Yeah. yeah. Sorry, yeah. But I think Amanda's wondering if you, if we go back and look at uh, the people who dropped out, were they higher on cyberbullying? bullying? Is that okay, the, yeah. Yeah, just um, yeah. Did it. Yeah, did the dropouts take it? From a super. Can you open that? I think it's just kind yeah. of related to what Brandon was saying. So, as far as I understand it, though, most of these studies like compare cognitive diffusion to the structure at like a group level to ensure that they're both as effective. Yeah. So we kind of give them thought to what in fact is going to determine who will work best for. Yeah, yeah, so exactly. Maybe yeah. Somebody's already struggling to even identify a thought. Yes, yeah, so that could be good yeah, to have that in his work. Yeah. Too small for them, too abstract. Yeah, so, exactly. Yeah. You know, that probably would be good to actually have a screen for that yeah. to see how they're for individual yeah. yeah. In terms of how it's affecting the outcome, it might be an interesting covariate yeah, yeah. to determine which strategy is most effective. Yeah. But we have within well, we we'll definitely have data to be able to see. Okay, who was this actually working for? You know, and we might be able to do some to distill mm -hmm. things down with that. I um, mean, simply designed it to do that, but I think we give us the informants in terms of yeah. And just yeah. maybe about the Larson study, if I can ask one more thing. Yeah. Can the slides? It seems as if you gave people an example of fusion exercises in one condition. Right? Yeah. But then, for the so yeah, you gave them examples of the fusion. But then for the next slide, you gave them examples of so it's not the fusion slides. So you can give like examples of structure. This so is like you're telling one group the solution, and you're telling your group the problems. No, so they, no, they, yeah, they, like, but they did. No, they both kind of had a psychoeducation reason, and they had experience in exercise. So they, they this group had to go through thinking of examples of these and themselves, and, yeah. and how they would apply them. Oh, so, so they did get examples of yeah. the structure. Okay. Yeah. Sorry, I was just wondering. Yeah, yeah, sorry. I was just wondering how you interpret the um, increase in the DAS scores in the control group. Were they were you inducing Rumination, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I kind of thought maybe, yeah, maybe that they actually had never really thought about these, and all of a sudden, once they were, they're actually going to know, you know. So yeah. that is a possible, like, just the control kind of, yeah. So, do you need some kind of control distractor task? Yeah, yes. but, yeah, that might be probably a good idea, yeah, to have a, yeah, that instead. Do that. Yeah, that no, thing. no, definitely, that's a good suggestion, yeah. How did you locate that test? How did you, t how did you test that? How did you determine that was the control group different? I just that. went the post hoc analysis. What post hoc did you do? That's what it says. So did you have a significant interaction? Um, I think I was just, I'm not 100% sorry. But this one here. I kind of. Um, so the time effect right there is that it's collapsed for group, so you can't pull out the control group from that. That's just yeah. the time effect collapsed. I had a line of code actually from Mark get me here and yeah, we were able to explore the location where the differences were. So we kind of put that into the SPSS script and it identified where the difference was. 
for us. Did you, so you have an interaction? Yeah. Then you would report main effects of the interactions anyway. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, was, I was confused myself because you can't yeah, determine yeah. that that's from the main effect. Yeah. You just can't. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, uh, that's not possible. We're going to end up with the third group in as well, which could skew that, it like could, yeah, could yeah. impact on that interaction again. But yeah, but you could only you could only determine that. that yeah, yeah, sorry, that's right. Effect, which and then if you have an interactive effect, you wouldn't be reporting on your main effects of time group. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I think we leave it there. If anyone has further questions for Anita, they can follow up afterwards. Anita, thanks very much. It's very comprehensive. Yeah, sorry.